Welcome to the 40 Days Podcast, a weekly podcast all about learning to practice the spiritual disciplines of Jesus and reflecting on your own spiritual journey. Let's jump in. Hi, this is Pastor Tim. I want to welcome you to week three of 40 Days of Growth. Um, excited to share some information with you this week about one of the real foundational things, which is the scriptures, the Bible, those 66 books that have been compiled uh, and are considered the Word of God. So here's what I want you to consider. What if God wrote you a letter? And what if in that letter, he not only told you his heart for you, but he also gave you some invaluable information um, to make sense of who you are and why you're here? What if that letter was blessed by God with some special abilities that not only carried the word, but through those words, the very power of God was present? Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, it isn't enchanted or magic, but it does bring with it some special properties given by its author. And what if God wrote it in such a way that it had elements of history and biography, poetry, prophecy? What if it contains some of the most beautifully profound words ever spoken? and was an absolutely unparalleled treasure trove of wisdom and prudence. All the while, it's laid out in such a way that trying to absorb the whole thing was part adventure, part spy novel, part greatest story ever told. What if every time you read it, you found some new layer or twist that you had never seen before? And what if it was like a diamond that depending on how you held it up to the light, then man, different beauty comes in to focus. And what if it, what if reading it was like looking in a mirror? And as you look in the mirror, you see yourself from a bunch of different angles. What if God wrote you a letter that was like all of that? Would you read it? We do have such a letter that literally is all of that and more. We call it the Bible. Here are a few metaphors that the Bible says about itself. The Bible says that it's a seed that saves. It's like milk that nourishes. The Bible's like meat that satisfies. It's like water that washes us. It's like fire that cleanses us. It's like a hammer that will shatter us. It's like a sword that will cut deeply into us. It's like medicine that will keep us from the sickness of sin. It's like a mirror that will reflect ourselves back. It's like a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it's like a counselor that comforts us. I want you to remember, uh, is the Bible important? Sure. In Matthew chapter 4, we read the story of Jesus being tempted in the desert. Right after his baptism, the very first thing that he did as part of ministry is he went out into the desert and spent 40 days fasting and praying. And at the end, uh, the devil showed up to tempt him. And in every temptation, there were three. In every temptation, Jesus answered that temptation with scripture. He quoted Deuteronomy three different times. Uh, it's really interesting that in the second temptation, the devil quoted scripture back to Jesus. But like the devil does, he twisted it a little to change its meaning. And Jesus straightened him out with other scripture, using scripture to interpret scripture. Remember what he said? Man doesn't live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And those words were recorded for us in the Bible. But is the Bible the word of God? And how do we know that it's the word of God? How do we know that it's not just part of the Word of God and something like the Koran or the Book of Mormon or War and Peace is not the Word of God? How do we know that? Well, I think the burden of proof has to lie on what does the book claim about itself? What does it say about itself? Well, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but by men moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. It's claiming that this is God's word, inspiration. David said in 2 Samuel, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. To Isaiah, God said, my words have I put in your mouth. In Matthew, Jesus said, how is it then that David speaking by the spirit calls him Lord. Peter says that people distorted Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to me. And in fact, this phrase, the word of the Lord came to me, meaning God empowered me to speak his word. That occurs 57 times directly And there are hundreds of variations of it in the scripture. In Matthew, Jesus speaking, he says, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your own traditions. He's calling the Bible the word. In 1 Peter, again, Peter says, you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring what? Word of God. Hebrews said, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between bone and marrow, between soul and spirit. Jesus again in Matthew 5, do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And Jesus, again, uses it to defeat his own temptation. Well, I want you to think for a minute. I want you to think for a minute about um, where did the Bible come from? The most conservative... um, most conservative we have of years is estimate of years is that it was written over about 1500 years there are 66 books and those 66 books were written by uh, 40 various authors its authors had a wide range of occupations life experiences they were kings They were fishermen, they were farmers, they were doctors, they were prophets, they were missionaries, they were warriors. The Bible was written in three basic languages. In Hebrew, which is um, the Jewish language, it was written in Greek, which was the common language of the New Testament, and it was written in Aramaic, which is a dialect of Hebrew that was spoken during Jesus' time. It speaks to and contains literally hundreds of topics, literally hundreds of topics. And it contains a wide variety of literary styles. There's history, there's poetry, there's epic, 
There's parable. There's allegory. There's apocalyptic literature. There's prophecy. And yet, and yet, it is the continuous unfolding drama of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. I want you to think about this for a second. If we went backwards 1,500 years from now, we would be in 522 AD. Consider that in 522, one of your distant relatives one of your distant, distant relatives wrote a book about his experience with God. And then for the next 1,500 years, 38 of your relatives, that man's descendants, also wrote books about their experience of God. And finally, your first cousin finished his last book last month in January. He finished the last book. And over those 1,500 years, think of how the world has changed. Those people who wrote it, they lived in different countries. Some of them spoke different languages. Some were in the midst of war. Some were in great times of prosperity. Some were... Kings, they had all sorts of varieties. They were political leaders. Some were commoners. Some had, had hard jobs and hard lives. And yet, when they finished those books and you put them together, all of those books told one story. Think of how amazing that is. It's the continuous unfolding drama of the redemption from Genesis to Revelation, it tells the story of the creation and the fall, and then ultimately the redemption, and then the recreation of man to his right relationship with God. Everything, everything from Genesis chapter 3, everything from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 20, tells that story. Now, Jesus is the central theme of the story. In the Old Testament, Jesus is looked for. He's the promised Messiah. He's prophesied about over 300 times. He is realized then, those prophecies are realized in the person and work of Jesus. And so you see in the New Testament that he's also present, but then he's also looked for because he returns to heaven and promises to come back. And all of the book will finally be fulfilled on his return. The Bible has this one unified message. The problem is human sin. The solution is salvation through the ultimate divine provision. That's Jesus. Well, what did Jesus say about the scripture? Well, he said it is written, authoritatively giving um, credence to the scripture 12 different times. 12 different times. He talks about the scripture having um, authority for practice. He talked about the historicity of the scriptures. He talked about it by citing the creation, the flood, Jonah and the belly of the fish. He talked about all of those as, as if they were historically accurate. There is no question that Jesus accepted the Jewish Bible as having authority. There's no question that he did that. How can we come to trust the scripture? Well, let me give you an example from scripture. Um, there's the story of Jesus returning to Capernaum, 
and him being in a house and teaching. And there are so many people gathered that you can't get into the house. And four guys bring a paralytic. And let me tell that story. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get him, get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes who were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within himself, said to them, Why are you thinking about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. And listen to this. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. So they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. Do you see what Jesus did there? He verified his authority to forgive sins by um, showing his ability to supernaturally heal the paralytic. He said, you want to know if I have the authority to forgive sins? I'm going to heal this man, and the healing was the proof of his authority, right? In the same way, God verifies the inspiration of the scripture when he supernaturally raised Jesus from the dead. One verifies the other. In the scripture, God promises that the Messiah will come, that he'll suffer, he'll die, he'll be raised from the dead. Those prophecies are all through the Old Testament. God verifies the authority of the scripture when he raises Jesus from the dead. Can you trust the scripture? Yes, you can trust it. Jesus resurrection, what Jesus said about the scripture, what the apostles, the disciples said about the scripture, all mean that you can trust it. It is the living and active word of God that you need to engage. Now, here's the thing. How we engage it and what speaks to us And the way that God sends us to engage the scripture really can be very different. If you remember an illustration from a couple of weeks ago, you know, if we're talking about this garden motif, different plants need, they all need sunlight, they all need water, they all need nutrients from the soil, right? But they need them in varying degrees and in varying ways. And what would be healthy for one plant would actually be toxic for another. In the same way, how you engage scripture is going to be unique to you. Not that you just get to go make up your own thing, but there are various ways that will be more helpful to you than not. And so this week, as we go through our devotions, there are going to be different ways for you to try out the try out engaging the Bible. I'm going to really challenge you to come at this with an open heart, with an open mind, with sort of a sense of adventure, 
and to experiment to see what works. I went through a season early in my um, in my following of Jesus where I needed to memorize, and man, I memorized a lot of scripture. I did. I put a lot in there. I'm not in that season anymore. While it's still helpful for me to memorize some, I'm not memorizing like I used to. Right? I, repetitive and meditating are now much more what's been helpful for me. How are you going to engage the scripture? What's going to help most for you? Again, come at this. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to make an adventure out of this. I'm going to see what works and what way God's spirit speaks through me. What if God wrote you a letter? What if in that letter, he not only told you his heart for you, but he also gave you some invaluable information to make sense of who you are and why you're here? Would you read it? Would you read it? Knowing, knowing that his spirit is carried in the words. The choice is really up to you. Will you engage this letter or not? And if you haven't been doing it, it's like everything else. It'll be a little awkward at first. It'll get easier and richer and richer and incrementally, God will change you. Man, I hope you'll engage. Have a great week. Well, thanks for joining us today. You can find our show notes with all the things we've talked about over on our website at astero.church. And don't forget, you can access our weekly devotional there or on the Astero Church app. If you loved this podcast, please share it with a friend. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.